This is Dennis Ramondi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg. Our podcast and a YouTube channel, Spirit Matters, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. Uh, open to the public, uh, 260 plus shows in our archives. Uh, we have the great pleasure of having on our show today, Krishna Das. Uh, we will refer to him as KD on the show. Uh, he was uh, studied with uh, Ram Das, traveled with him, uh, was inspired by uh, Ram Das to uh, go in 1970 to India to study with Neem Karoli Baba, uh, the famous guru, and uh, inspired by his teacher to <clears throat> bring Kirtan to the world, which he has done. And I, I just want to say that last night, I went on YouTube and I started listening to Kirtans by KD, which I had done before, but I couldn't stop listening. Uh, his rendition of the Maha Mantra was just mind-boggling, and uh, I'll probably be listening to it for the next few nights. So if you haven't heard him, please uh, hear him, go to his concerts, and Phil will be telling you, and we'll be talking about later, uh, a uh, fundraiser he's going to be doing for India sometime soon. So thank you so very much, KD, for taking the time to come on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks Welcome. for inviting me. Welcome, KD. Um, we're recording this on May 28th, 2021, uh, and at the moment, uh, India is caught in a terrible crisis with uh, COVID, and we uh, especially wanted you on now because you are part of a benefit uh, that's coming up June 6th called Chant for India, and we want to make people aware of it. Uh, Krishna Das is one of uh, many uh, kirtan artists who will be uh, performing live, of course, online, uh, beginning at uh, 9.15 Pacific time, 12.15 East Coast. And uh, the guests the guests performing will include uh, a few people we've had on the show before, like Deva Pramal and Niten and Jai Uttal. And it's free and everybody should go and donate generously. You can find uh, tickets at uh, tickets.brightstarevents.com and look for Chant for India. Uh, KD, thank you so much for being here. You have long connections to India, and yeah. uh, no doubt that's why you and the others are doing this. Give us uh, a sense of how you came originally to discover the, the art and science of Kirtan and your uh, connection to India. Well, uh... You know, I met Ramdas in 1960, winter of 68, 69. And that's when I started to hear about Maharaji, Neem Karoli Baba. And then after traveling around with Ramdas for about a year and a half, I went to meet the old man in India. So, and he let me stay for two and a half years with him there. Not all the time with him, but he let me stay in India. He kept me there. And while I was there, you know, I really was uh, exposed to the chanting practice, practice of chanting. And uh, it just, it spoke, it really spoke to me. It sang to me, actually. So I just started chanting. And uh, when I came back, uh, he sent me back home and then he left his body after that. So it took me a long time, but then I, I, I had to find a, a, a way to really chant, uh, to really access a deeper place in myself. It, it took it from an, more or less an external kind of feeling to a much more internal kind of feeling because I needed to find my guru inside. Uh, he wasn't available outside anymore. So that's that's a very short little <laughs> excerpt about from then to now <laughs> in, that, in that time from then to now you you are probably more than any person certainly in the west to popularize uh, kirtan worldwide i had a question for you i'm not a musician 
uh, but I love music and I, I, I have great appreciation for people that create music. Uh, before you did Kirtan, you, you were a member of a very successful rock group, uh, Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. My son-in-law, who's only 40, is completely familiar with them. So <laughs> they, they stood, withstood the te test of time. Uh, when you uh, went but, from... Let me just, since yeah. other people will hear this, let's set the record straight. I was never actually a member of Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, I, I met the boys when they were in high school in Stony Brook. We started playing music together. We formed a little band and then I quit and ran away. Years later, uh, I was invited back into the band by the manager, but that just happened to be on the very night that I was on my way to meet, to, to live up in New Hampshire with Ramdas for the first time. So there was no question of going back to the band at that point, so. Great, a decision you are very glad you made, I'm sure. Now, here's my question though. You, you did have experience singing at all. When you sing, you have a certain internal experience. When you sing for a crowd, I'm told uh, that there's a certain uh, experience people have that, that they really enjoy. When you first sang Kirtan, what was that experience like? And how did it maybe differ from doing other types of music? Well, kirtan is a spiritual practice. It's not a performance, mm -hmm. very simply. You're not doing it for other people. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it to get other people off. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not thinking about what other people are feeling or not feeling. You're, you're doing your practice. Mm -hmm. It involves other people because they're doing their practice, which is to respond to the to the line that you give them. Then they respond back and forth, back and forth. So technically or theoretically, I am the leader in that particular little practice and other people respond, but it, it's an internal practice. The awareness mm -hmm. stays inside. You're, you're trying to be aware, to pay attention, to, to move more deeply into your own heart. In no way is it performance and, and uh, if you're doing it as a performance, then you're not getting any benefit uh, mm -hmm. spiritually for yourself or others, because you're. Then it just becomes an external musical experience. Now, music is not enough by itself. If music was enough, every musician would be happy, mm. or every musician would know their God, right. even right. But that doesn't seem to be the case, right? Does it? So. The music is like a syrup that the medicine of the name is hidden within that syrup. Like and that. We, the sweetness of the syrup allows you to take the medicine, but it's the medicine that cures you, not the syrup. So it's a very different situation. Although reality wise, you have, one has to deal with those issues because everybody has those desires to be famous, to be known, to be loved, and all that stuff comes up. The difference is that because this is a spiritual practice, those simply become something to let go of in the moment. Mm -hmm. You don't reinforce them. They don't, they arise mm -hmm. a sense from your own uh, tendencies of the way you think, what they call it vasanas of the mind, but you let them go because that's not why you're there. That said, KD, um, is there a difference in, ex in the inner experience of your practice when you chant by yourself and when you have a crowd? Uh, and, and given that, what has it been like uh, through the pandemic when you didn't have that live audience? Really, I don't think there's a difference oh. uh, because even when I'm in a crowd of people, once I start to sing, once I start to chant and do my practice, so to speak, everything becomes a part of the practice. Whatever arises, is, there's not, nothing outside of the practice in those moments, whether people are dancing or, or leaving, it's all part of the practice. And so same thing here, you know, it took a little while to get used to the technology and, and the the digital drum machine, pressing the right buttons at the right time, all that nonsense, you know? But it's just, it's just the practice. And I do miss hearing the responses because <clears throat> one loves to hear the name as well as sing the name. But 
that's I hear it in my mind, you could say. Mm -hmm. So it's really not that much difference. Uh, I do miss playing with with my band, so to speak, you know, the guys who are the, the people I always play with. Uh, but that's secondary. You know, once you sit down to start your practice, that's what you do. You're doing your practice and whatever that means to each person. Mm -hmm. Katie, uh, let's go back to 1970 when you first went to India. I wish I could. I'd be a very <laughs> young man. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have all this pain. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are in the same club. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, you obviously had heard about uh, Neem Karoli Baba from uh, Ram Das and yeah. maybe others. But when you first went there, what was that experience? What was the initial experience of meeting him like? Well, first of all, going to India, arriving in India was extraordinary experience. Just getting there, I immediately felt totally at home. Mm -hmm. I was so, I was really blown away by that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had never had that feeling anywhere. Even in the house I grew up in, I never felt this feeling of being home like that. And then going up to the mountains, it even became stronger. And going to meet Maharaji, uh, uh, funny thing, it was a little, it was a little confusing at first because ever since I met I had met Ramdas. I had been feeling Maharaji everywhere, all the time. He was like the space that I lived in, you know? And then when I walked into the room where he was sitting, it was like, wait a minute, how does all that fit inside that blanket? You know, and I was like, wait, how does this work? Mm -hmm. My mind just couldn't, couldn't connect the dots in a way, but I got over it really quick. <laughs> And uh, it was, uh, yeah. he uh, talks about when he first met uh, Maharaji and it was expected that you would prostrate yourself by the guru and touch his feet. Yeah. Now he, he, no, he, he was <laughs> this, you know, cognitive yeah. psychologist who wasn't about to do that. How did right. you respond to the customs around the guru at that time? No problem. I was totally into it. Uh. No problem at all. Ramdas is coming from a very different uh, world than we than we were than coming. We were we were all younger than him. We didn't even have lives at the time. We hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. We just graduated high school, started traveling around the states blah, blah, blah. We didn't have jobs. We didn't have careers. He had a whole life that he was carrying with him that in a sense, Maharaji had to uh, wash away, you mm -hmm. know, open him up from that. We also had to be opened up, but we didn't have those issues because we didn't identify ourselves with our jobs or our careers or our training or our uh, knowledge or anything like that. It was, we were just, in a sense, we were hippies, you know, what people would call hippies. We didn't have lives. We hadn't done anything. <laughs> it was a really interesting moment. Cause I, I thought I was going to stay in India for the rest of my life. Uh -huh. I gave everything away. I sold everything I had to sell. I was never coming back. Oh. I, I wanted to ask, uh, we had Larry Brilliant on the show. Uh, the he greatest, was a yeah. great guy. He went, he went to, same thing. He went, he was young. He was a doctor. And he, he had no plans on going anywhere. And then uh, Neem Karoli Baba, the guru, uh, told him to go out and be part of the uh, eradication of smallpox, which I don't yeah. think he was expecting to do. In your case, not. What, was, yeah. it, was it your guru that encouraged you, was it Neem Karoli Baba, to do kirtan? We, you, 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 did he change your thinking about just staying there and then going out? Were you fulfilling what he was, uh, your, his direction? No, absolutely not. Absolutely, it was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. We started singing to Maharaji because he liked it. Mm -hmm. And it was also our way of buying time with him, you know, because mm -hmm. really we didn't, he didn't let people sit around very much. He would send people away. Mm -hmm. So he would, little, he would see our little group of Westerners, you know, for a while. And then he'd send us to the back of the temple for, for the whole day. And then when the bus came, to take us back to town we would see him for a couple of minutes and then he would send us away 
So this was our way of like, you know, grabbing more time with him. Mm. Um, he never told me what to do that way, like that. He never gave me those kind of instructions. He made me find out for myself what I wanted. In fact, the last, my, my last instruction from him when he was sending me back to America after two and a half years, I said, what should I do? You know, I, what do I do in America? I've been in India for two and a half years, you know, <laughs> walking around barefoot in a red dress. What, I, you know, what do I do? Yeah. He just said, you know, do what you want. Who ever tells you to do what you want? Not your mother, that's for sure. So that was big time for me. That really still, that's my overriding uh, logic for life. This is how I found myself in my way into chanting and then into chanting with people. I had to do what I wanted, what I needed to do. I had to find out what that was. Nobody was going to tell me. Nobody, I didn't trust anybody to tell me. And he never did. He, and if he had told me, it would be very different. Then I'd be doing it because he said to do it, mm -hmm. which be okay. I'm, I don't know how that would have been long term other than because I was such a rebellious person, I, I might not have ever come to terms with it. But because I had to find out what worked for me, that put the responsibility on me. Even to this moment, this this moment, I I have to listen to my own heart. And that was very hard, is very hard sometimes to what to do. Yeah. Back in the day, that's what we all wanted was to just do what we want. But then when it came to figuring out what that is, that, that became, that was a, a rather different thing. And yeah. in those days, <clears throat> or with respect to kirtan, the only kirtan that most of us were exposed to were the, the Hare Krishna people. And that was a very different kind of thing. It was very um, limited to that lineage um so when you... i hadn't i hadn't heard that much of that you know i remember seeing them chant uh -huh. in in new york city on the corner once but that was the only because ah. mm -hmm. it was i don't know when they started doing that but you know i was i went to india in, in august 1970 so i don't know how much they were doing at that point um but i did hear them sing once in new york city i heard that chanting it didn't move me at the time uh so but when you you came back from india eventually you started doing kirtan in public um and at at the time it, none of us had really been exposed to it very much except if you went to yeah. Thompson square park when when the christians were there and yeah um yeah. now Obviously, you didn't set out to make a career of being I'm, a kirtan. Yeah. It wasn't on the list of like, you know, ways to earn a living. So yeah. how much did it surprise you that, you know, the way things have evolved over the last few decades? Uh, it surprises me every day, you know. Yeah. I, I, I started singing to save my ass, you know. I had to, I was... I didn't start singing with people for 21 years after mm -hmm. Maharaji died. And those 21 years were very difficult for me, very difficult time. A lot of, because when he left the body, I felt completely lost and I felt like I would never ever feel good again in a real deep way, the way I felt when I was with him. And so it took a long, long, long time of, and a lot of unhappiness to get to the point where I recognized that I had to sing with people. In fact, I had an epiphany in my room in New York where I knew all of a sudden that I had to sing with people. That was the only way I had that was going to uh, free me from the dark shadows and the dark corners in my own heart. And if I didn't do it, it wasn't going to happen. So. It took a while to get with the program, but then I finally, you know, I, I had to start 
because I wanted to be free of the suffering, but it, it took a certain amount of suffering to uh, force me to start singing. I'm curious, Katie, uh, when you're al alone, when you're traveling or you're home or during a pandemic, when you, there is an audience, it's just you, it's the same chanting. Uh, does uh, the uh, kirtan, does the chanting ever take the form of just not verbalizing it, but just uh, letting that go on inside? Mostly, yeah. Mostly when I'm alone, uh, I don't sing so much out loud, although I really... I've been singing more, but it's more quieter, you know, japa, more repetition mm -hmm. like that, quiet, quiet. But I do sing, um, and I should sing more actually, because it's there's something about that for me, singing out loud, that helps me overcome the nonsense in my head, you know, the ongoing mm -hmm. bullshit in the head. So there's a difference between internal uh, use of the same sound and the externalization of it, it sounds like in, in the experience. For me, it is, yeah. Yeah. Can well, but mostly because I think I pay better attention if I can hear hmm. out loud. I don't know why. I don't know what that is. Talk to us a bit about, uh, I want to come back to, you, you used syrup as a, in a metaphorical sense before. Could you speak to that a little bit more? For our, our uh, viewers, what what is the syrup in kirtan, and uh, what is the significance of the, the the particular sounds that are used? Well, let, let's get that clear. The syrup is the music; it's the name that we're chanting, the names that we're chanting, which is the medicine. So the syrup is the music which uh, helps us pay attention and gives us a way of bringing out that sound which we can hear and share with other people. But it's the name, it's those mantras that actually plant the seeds that will destroy our suffering and our unhappiness and our sense of separation from other people, our greed, our shame, our fear, our selfishness, this is what the name will free us from, but you have to do it. So one of the ways of doing it is, is to chant and to sing. And so, you know, these mantras, what they call the, the, the sacred name or the names of God have, are, are very powerful mantras. Um, they come with a potentiality, uh, just like a seed a little tiny seed can have a whole oak tree in it, right? A huge tree. So do these little repetitions of these names. They carry tremendous uh, energy and potential. And we plant those seeds by repeating, by paying attention to the name, by repeating the names. We plant those seeds in our life stream, in our mind stream, in our hearts. And, and they will grow and give us uh, ultimately bring us back to who we really are. Because these names, even though we, on one level, they're, they're the, the names of the so-called Hindu deities or this and that, those, we don't even know, what does that mean? <laughs> we don't know what that means. These are words we use, we don't know what they mean. What they really mean is your own true nature, ultimately, who you really are, your soul, so to speak, which is a part of the great soul not different, not separate. So these are the names of that place inside of us. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up, Dennis, with that? Oh, go. Um, somebody looking in from the outside would say, yeah, but, you know, Hindus associate these particular mantras with particular deities that are depicted in forms and have legends behind them and attributes and stories. So some are Hanuman and some are Durga and some are you know, Lakshmi and some are Krishna and all that. How do you explain that to people? Nothing to explain, nothing to explain. Uh, if someone says that to me, I would say, well, fine. Uh, find out who you are first. This is a way of finding that out because when you chant, <laughs> The, what you do is every time you notice that you've been lost in thought, 
You simply come back to the chant. There's no question of believing anything, having kind of blind faith in anything, conceptualizing anything, understanding anything. You just come back to the chant. And you first you, you, you'll you be sitting down with a thousand people and you're singing and then the next thing you know, you've been gone for like a half an hour thinking about what you can do the next day. You're leaving on a vacation, where you're going to go, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, oh, Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai, you come back to the chant. That has nothing to do with anybody, any Hindu deity up in the sky or anywhere else. It has to do with you being able to pay attention and recognize what it means to be present. That's it. And all those thoughts about what you just said about these are the Hindu deities, blah, blah, blah. That's a thought. Let it go and come back to the sound of the name. Period. You don't have to do anything else. And if you can do that, then you're really in good shape because it's very hard to do. <laughs> Katie, I'm curious. Is there one uh, mantra, one, one uh, kirtan that, not, not your favorite, but one that you most naturally uh, uh, are drawn to or, or comes to you uh, in the most fundamental way? Like you're there, you, is there one that uh, is always, uh, not always there, but that, that comes to you most naturally? Or that you have the most affinity toward? Not really, because mm -hmm. to me, they all feel the same. Mm -hmm. They feel like presence, mm -hmm. like like being, like here-ness, like vast space, like being, you know? They all, uh, they all feel to me like my guru, to put it simply. Mm -hmm because that's what he feels like to me mostly these days, this vast presence in which I live. And so through the chanting, it brings me back to that, hopefully deeper and deeper as time goes on. So it really, it's kind of like he used to say, all one, you know, he used to say that all the time, all one. And that's kind of what it is for me. It's not about, I just don't experience it that way. Other people do, maybe, you know, they have ideas about things and they've read about this and that and the goddess feels like this and Raman feels like this and Shiva feels like that. I'm too dull and too uh, mm -hmm. too slow-witted to uh, get into that stuff. I just sing and that's all I care about. Nice. I don't want to understand anything. I want to feel that love that lives within me. If I could follow up, certainly you must have noticed, and it must bring you some joy over the years there, people come to one of your kirtans and and come up to you afterwards. And, you know, it's not an ego thing, but just saying, hey, you, you opened up something to me that wasn't, that was always there that I feel I can connect to. How do I keep getting there? Do I do, I do kirtan? Do I listen to more kirtan? What do you advise them at that point? You listen to your heart about what 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 it is you feel you you mm -hmm. you could do to help yourself. Mm -hmm. Whether it means listening to my CDs, or mm -hmm. listening to someone else's CDs, or you know whatever you it's up to you. Uh, people come and Maharaji touches them, and then they have to find their own way back into that to feel that you know. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, once I was on my way to, I was, inter I was interviewed by a, the Montreal newspaper. And I just said, you know, I'm like, a, I'm like a spiritual slut. You know, I'll take it anywhere I can get it. I don't care. <laughs> uh, well, you know, so on the front page of the paper, a <laughs> slut comes to Montreal. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but it's like, it's like that, you know, I, I just want to feel that and whatever, mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to try to find a way to live in that love all the time. I think, you, and it's not easy. You missed the branding opportunity there. In case. <laughs> I, I don't think people are rushing after using that. To tell you the truth. <laughs> um, how much attention do you uh, pay to um, precise pronunciation of the mantras and uh, the the use of traditional uh, musical forms and as opposed to inventing 
uh, or improvising musically? How much, how much does that, uh, what, what some people have told me is a kind of ongoing tension between tradition and you know, adaptation to our own styles of things. How much does that enter into your, your, your thought? And About zero, <laughs> maybe less. <laughs> you would say that. That's what I was hoping you would say. <laughs> you know, when I first started singing with people, I, start, I would sing the chants that I had been singing in India because that's what I knew. But as time went on, and the the feelings were deepening so did the music change to be a more kind of uh natural to what me growing up on long island was like you know and in fact walter becker from steely dan who was a friend of mine mm -hmm. one of the first times he came to hear me sing he said you know, we said, we should do a garage band record of this stuff because that's what you're hearing, he said to me. And he was right. You know, I hear I hear it like, you know, three, three or four chord rock and roll in my head. That's what it's musically. That's what it's like for me. So. Uh, it it just naturally took that shape, you know, and. It, it there's really no plan here, you know, I, I, I appreciate people you know, trying to give me credit for things, but in all honesty, you know, it's, it's very difficult to accept, accept that because there's, there's been no plan. I started singing the save my ass and I was up to here on the water, right? Like this. And if I sang, I stayed right here. I could breathe. If I don't sing, I go under. Mm -hmm. So I have to sing and stay right here. That's it. What's everything comes from that. Everything comes from that. There's no, you know, and I had some issues when I first started to sing with people. I noticed, you know, I had some some real crises and I actually quit singing with people after about, uh, maybe about four or five, six months, I quit singing with people and I went to India and I was, talking to Maharaji, you know, in my mind, he's already been dead, you know, 25, 30 years. I said, I can't do this. I'm not pure enough. I, I'm going to use all this to satisfy all those hungry desires. And I'm going to hurt other people. I'm going to hurt myself. No, I'm not doing it. You have to fix this. You fix it. I sing. You don't fix it. I don't sing. That's it. Good night. And about three months went by. I was in India for three months and nothing happened. Finally, the last couple of days before I had to return to the States, he fixed it. He changed everything for me. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's why I can do what I'm doing. Cause he, he, he saved me. And that whole story is in my book, Chance of a Lifetime, I was <laughs> if you want to read it. I just did an audio book of it too. So it's also on audio audible. The cleverly but, titled memoir, Chance of a yeah. Lifetime. MC Yogi gave me that name. Did he? Yeah, he's the great. We interviewed him. Did we interviewed him. He's yeah, he's great. Huh? Great guy. Very bright. Great. Very bright. Well, one last question from me, uh, KD. Musical. And, 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 and that is um, uh, the people that do come uh, to your uh, performances, your concerts, or to hear you, better way to put it is to sit there while you're chanting. Uh, do those, uh, uh, have the audiences changed much over the years? Uh, the type of people that come, the responses, that sort of thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I start singing, I, my eyes close and then they open and it's over and- Over. You know, I don't know. Well, she wrote. I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of Indian people come over mm -hmm. the war in the last few years, you know. Actually, when when I was nominated for the Grammy, mm -hmm. that the one place in the world where that really uh, had an made an impression was in India. Right. That somebody who 
chance Kirtan could be nominated for a Grammy? You know, that what? This is, who is this guy? So it made a, that was very, uh, that had a big effect on people in India. Yeah. Other than that, there wasn't, you know, so I think that's when the Indian people started to come more, when they heard about me more. Well, speaking of India, uh, oh, yeah. before we wrap up, let us uh, once again say that on June 6th, 2021, 2021, right. Those of you who are tuning into this in our archives in future years, you missed out on this, but maybe <laughs> available on YouTube. But there's a benefit concert for India. All the money is going to be channeled, all the donations, because the event itself is free, but you have to register at uh, Bright Star events. Chant for India on June 6th, 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 9.15 a.m. Pacific Time, but it's all over the world. So if you're in uh, Europe, it'll be something like 5.15. And it's uh, four or five hours of very well-known and highly talented kirtan artists. You'll be asked to donate, and I hope you will all donate uh, generously because India needs help. And, right. and we'll have all of this information posted up uh, so you can uh, 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 get that. And I know what I'm going to do in a couple of hours, and that's listen to some more kirtans by KD. I, I have to, I'm, I'm not making this up. I started listening last night. And I, I, I stopped doing everything else. It really takes you to a different place. And yeah, it, it's, I'm listening to somebody going through a procedure to bring themselves inward. And in doing that, I'm going inward. And it's, uh, it's very powerful. It's a tremendous mood elevator. Uh, and, and, but more than that, you're going to that, uh, that very special unbounded place. Thank you. So, yeah. Me too. Thanks, KD. Any last words for our Ram Ram? <laughs> All the best, everybody. All the best. Maybe everybody Make be happy um, and healthy. And, then, and uh, there's a ton of Krishna Das on YouTube, and of course, his albums are available. His memoir, Chance of a Lifetime, should be read. And uh, this uh, concert on June 6th. Uh, please tune in and be generous to India in its hour of need. Thanks, KB. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That was uh, Krishna Das, probably the best known uh, kirtan player in the uh, performer in the world. And you know, my observation, I was very happy to interview him. I was in the Western world, Dennis. In the Western world, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that has popularized it. But what, what uh, I was taken by is often somebody, look, he's got a big following. People hear him chant. It's unavoidable that there are some people who are gonna look at him as like a guru. And it would be very easy for a person like that to become very egotistical, very guru-like, very, uh, pretentious and not not guru like in a good way in a in a in artificial way and he was just the opposite he's very humble he's very honest uh he didn't go on and on about what great internal unbounded experiences he had but hey he's doing his best to get through life just like all of us and he uses this to do that and it's a type of procedure that he's able to share with other people that's right i mean i love listening to his stuff oh yeah if you haven't listened to it, by all means. Um, yes, I agree with you. I think in a sense, he's, he, it reminds me, his candor uh, and humility reminds me of Ram Dass, actually, because right. that's one of the things that you know we all loved about Ram Dass. Everybody wanted to treat him as a guru. And he just, you know, I mean, there were parts of him probably that relished the attention and all that, but he... He was honest about all that stuff and, uh, you know, just was real. And mm -hmm. people who are in a position of spiritual leadership, whether they seek it or it just happens to come their way, if when they do with a certain humility and uh, it, it, 
it's very appealing because you know, so many people are get puffed up around them. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on, uh, on a question you asked, which was a very good question. It was about the um, the preciseness of the names that are chanted. Because I've talked to some uh, Hare Krishna monks uh, that uh, will, they focus on the Maha Mantra and they chant that. And I was talking to one of the, uh, the monks and he was saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's both an art and a science, and there's been books written about it and how precise it is and how it's done. Uh, uh, KD, Krishna Das, put less emphasis on that, and I'm sure from his teacher as well, that just go with it. And actually, a lot of what he said reminded me of the things I've been taught about going inward, uh, you know, not a, a not heavy effort. It should be a simple and, uh, and, and pleasant experience, innocent experience. And, uh, but that, that was uh, interesting. I, it, 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 we've had uh, people from Krishna consciousness on, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have, including uh, Ranit Swami. It'd be interesting to ask that question and see no. what their thoughts on it. Not that there's a disagreement, but there's different ways to no, approach but there the same, there same rural unboundedness. You will find, especially uh, people of in, in India or of Indian descent, who are critical of. Uh, kirtan artists, especially who are not Indian, who they're critical of their pronunciation, and will make and they'll make a big argument that the precision of the pronunciation of the mantras is ter terribly important, at, and that minor deviations and all that make a big difference. Now the question is. Is that true? And then the question is, in my mind, and I think you know, probably KD would agree. If if you if there's a, a, a an absolute right way to pronounce mantras, and you do that, but your heart isn't open, is that in any way supposed to be superior to somebody? Who is singing with great heart and and elicits deep right. or devotional feeling in those who are listening? Uh, it does it matter then right. if the pronunciation is right. a little off? Right. I I think that's really well put because look, just from my own experience, I've heard a lot of kirtan. I've heard a lot of people chant. Some I like better than other. Uh, some I've heard from very. Uh, folks that were trained very rigorously in, in, in India. And uh, and I, look, as to me, if I listen to Krishna Das, I always enjoy it, I always feel good. Others I listen to, maybe I feel good, maybe at home, maybe whatever. It's like that. So, and, and I think it, it's that uh, in high heart value. You know, hey, it's, and not a direct comparison, but classical music, it's done this way, this way, this way. It's great. It has a huge effect on people. It's fantastic. Jazz is more improv improvisation. It's not as strict about certain things, although it, 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 it follows a certain form. So is one better than the other? I think it, it, maybe it depends on the individual, but the, the proof is in the pudding. How do you feel? What does it do for you? Yeah. And, and then there's people who also will criticize some of the Western, especially American uh, kirtan performers for bringing in sort of Western instrumentation, plugging in, having a bass guitar, having a drum set, right. whatever, as that because it's not traditional instruments. And then you find you go to India and sometimes you'll see kirtan concerts and they're plugged in and or they're playing with a violin. And the, the harmonium that right. is you know everybody thinks of as the traditional How old is that? That, that was that's a British invention. You know, right. the, the Indians adopted. So, you know, the artists probably, you know, don't care about these distinctions. And when I think of it, I always think um, that Rogers and Hammerstein song, my favorite things from uh, uh, Sound of the Music. You can hear that, and it's a little ditty. He drops on roses. Old Train's version. Yeah. It's right. A whole different world. Yeah, exactly. And it moves you, me, me anyway. It moves me in a, in a ways that mm. nobody possible. 
I mean, if Nina Simone were to sing my favorite things and got <laughs> the words wrong, I, you know, it wouldn't matter because it, it's the feeling, you know, that, right. that it evokes. It's a really good point about what it does, what it opens up. <clears throat> and I think uh, uh, Krishna Das, uh, in, in his approach to it, he, he's very honest. I don't know. I don't know how it works. What works for you? Follow your own. See what, get, get a feeling for that, that, uh, that, that uh, infinite, unbounded, that pure spirituality. And then whatever gets you there, you know, and I don't think whatever gets you there, but Kirtan is away. And, and, uh, and, but, but when you watch his concerts, they do, uh, ones on YouTube, fantastic. And they go into the audience. You see, it's very profound. And some people are sitting there quietly. Yeah. Other people are up dancing around. Yeah. Other people are practically doing back jump results. I'm the type that it feels to be active. Other people, but I could also have the experience of feeling very quiet and sitting like that. Was yeah. well, so it's affecting people in a million different ways, and that's great. But it, it seems like the, the vast majority, if not everybody, is going away feeling better than when they came in. That's why it became so popular. That's why there are kirtan mm -hmm. nights at yoga studios all over the place nowadays, mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. That's why people like Krishna Das are well known, and Deva Pramal, and you know all these people. They get huge audiences. Mm -hmm. Thirty years ago, it wasn't like that. No. But even if you just go, you know, to a, you know, some ordinary amateur kirtan leader, if there if there's heart and soul in it, you're going right. to be moved. I, I've had the experience many many times. Right. right. And, um, it it's of great value as a either a core part of somebody's spiritual experience uh, practices or uh, a, a peripheral part, but mm -hmm. it, it's a component in the sp spiritual repertoire. And you know what's interesting? And we should get this some of these people on. The popularity of kirtan has led to more overt use of music and traditional chanting in synagogues and, and certain Christian context. There's a guy called the Kirtan Rabbi. We should get him on the show. He does traditional Kirtan style, but with Hebrew. Oh, let's do it. Let's get him. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is I forgot to mention before. I think it's over here uh, on your screen. Hit the subscribe button. Whether you're listening to us uh, as a podcast or watching us, as you might be doing right now on YouTube, this is Phil. That's Phil. This is me. Uh, and uh, please subscribe. And also, I didn't mention this before, but I'll mention it now. Uh, thank you very much for those folks who have uh, sent in contributions to help, help keep us on the air free uh, and uh, I'm letting our archives and our shows be available to everyone everywhere. And we do have a worldwide audience. And uh, if you want to be one of those people that uh, can help us in that way, uh, just go to our YouTube channel, uh, Spirit Matters Talk, or to our website, spiritmatterstalk.com. And it's very simple uh, to uh, make that contribution. It's not tax deductible. We're not a nonprofit, but uh, you can you can contribute. So, Phil, a great array of guests. And also, if you have any ideas, email us, send us information. It's yeah. all posted up. And we'll follow up. Uh, we And uh, we'll meet with our committee and uh, get the uh, programming moving forward. We have some great stuff coming up. And uh, till next time, Phil. Um, one more time, if you're listening to this before June 6th, 2021, 2021 uh, Krishna Das, along with other uh, leading kirtan artists. Are Fabulous array of artists. Doing a, a four or five hour benefit concert called Chant for India. Uh, you can get uh, register for it at brightstarevents.com. Uh, it's free, but they'll be soliciting donations that will all go to the Ramakrishna Mission in India to uh, fund uh, some of the uh, terrible needs that India has at this moment of uh, COVID crisis. So please yeah, I mean, it, we many of us have gotten a tremendous amount from India. It's had a huge impact on our lives. Uh, and Phil's book, American Veda, about how those influences came to the West. So, uh, yes, let's all uh, be as supportive as we can be. And um, thanks for joining us.
next time.